Uh, in a new series uh, on, uh, on the book of uh, Luke. Uh, we are looking at uh, the, uh, Christ's call for uh, discipleship. And uh, just to be really simple, uh, the word disciple uh, simply means follower. And so when we're talking about discipleship or, or, or a discipleship or a disciple of Christ, we're simply saying, um, we're simply talking about someone uh, who is committed to mimicking or following Jesus Christ. And as Christians, uh, we are called uh, to be disciples. We are called to be followers. What that means, we're, 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 we're called to study the life of Jesus. We're called to uh, listen to his teachings. And we are called to follow in his footsteps. And for those of you guys who have tried to do this or who are trying to do this, I, I, I think you understand that this is not the easiest thing to do. In fact, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard. And what I really appreciated about Reverend Ted's uh, sermon uh, uh, is, is that he didn't uh, make it sound easy. And, and, and I know that sounds like a small thing, but it's not a small thing, you know, sadly, um, in our church culture where people intentionally water down the gospel, intentionally water down the commands of Christ in order to encourage more people to come, right? If we make the gospel, if we make the Bible more palatable, then people will come. People will be more willing to come into our churches. People will be more, and, and they would be satisfied with that. And I'm so grateful uh, when I was listening to Reverend Ted's sermon that he did none of that stuff. And I think as a church, you guys should be grateful that you have a pastor like that who is not willing to compromise biblical truth. But if you guys remember, he was just like, you know, Jesus, being a disciple of Christ means that Jesus is your first priority, that obedience to him takes precedence over everything. And when he said everything, when Jesus said everything, he meant everything. When Reverend Ted said everything, he meant everything. That's what it means to be his disciple, that we are to follow Jesus regardless of the cost to ourselves, regardless of the pain that we will face. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, uh, a pastor in Nazi Germany, uh, penned a book uh, called uh, The Cost of Discipleship. And in it, he talked about uh, how, how, how hard or how, how hard it was to follow Jesus and how high the cost of discipleship is. And, and really, the, the cost is high, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I was reading a book by a contemporary author this week, and, and, and he said something that, was, um, that, that I thought was great. It, it was a fantastic observation. What he said was, the cost of non-discipleship, the cost of not following Jesus, is even higher. And, and, and really, that's going to be our big idea for today. Our, our, our big idea for the day is the cost of discipleship is high. It is. We, we, we don't want to fool you into thinking that it isn't. We don't want to fool you into thinking that following Jesus is easy. Uh, the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Christ, of mimicking Christ, of hearing his teachings, putting his teachings into practice, communing with him is hard. The cost is high. But the cost of not following Jesus, the cost of non-discipleship is even higher. That's our big idea for the day. And before we get into our text, uh, I want to tell you how we're going to study our passage. Uh, we are not going to go sequentially uh, through our passage. We're going to go through it thematically. And so there will be a little bit of jumping around. And so I tell you this in advance so that you don't get lost uh, when we do start our jumping around. Like we'll, 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 we'll quickly skim over um, our, our, our passage sequentially and then we are going to begin uh, jumping around. Uh, there are notes in your bulletin uh, so you can follow along um, as well. Um, if you guys aren't into paper, um, there's also the PowerPoint that you guys can follow along with. All right, so um, ha having said that, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Um, uh, our passage begins uh, when, uh, with, with Jesus appointing 72 believers uh, to go and to proclaim uh, that the kingdom of God is near. And all Jesus is, and all Jesus is simply telling, he's like, just go and tell people that God is coming soon, that he's going to come to rule the world, that he's going to come and he's going to judge the world. Right, and if you're found to be good, you get to live with him uh, forever in heaven. If you're found to be bad, 
you are sentenced to an eternity apart from him in hell. Now, as a person, when you're presented with this reality, uh, automatically the question that comes into your mind is, you know, um, am I good enough? Right? Am I good enough? And at this moment, uh, you need to know that, um, that, that there are two uh, major uh, religious worldviews that seek to answer this question. The first is this, right? How do you know if you're good enough? You're good enough if you do the following, right? There's a standard of excellence um, uh, or, or, or a standard of conduct. If you do all of these things, right, if you pray this many times, you give this much to the poor, if you, um, if you, do, uh, if you do these amount of good deeds, then you're good enough and you're in. And the second religious worldview is, you know, you're, you're already good enough, right? You're already good enough. You know, you don't need to worry. God accepts you as you are, right? That God is merciful to everyone, and he really will judge no one. And these are the two, uh, and these are the two worldviews uh, that we have. Where one says, if you want to be good enough, do this. And the other says, you know, you don't need to do anything. You're already good enough. And just to let you know, Christianity fits into neither of these categories. See, what the Bible says is, you will never be good enough. You will never be good enough. But there is hope. But there is hope. See, on one hand, God says, you aren't good enough. Because the standard that the, Bible, that the Bible sets, the standard that the God of the Bible sets for you is perfection. You see that in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 48, right? Be perfect as I am perfect. And our God rewards perfection. But those who are not perfect, he will judge. And I think when we are faced with the standard of perfection, I think we can all just, just say with honesty that we fall short, right? Because it doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter how many good things we do. Our good deeds cannot erase our past wrongs, our past mistakes, and therefore we aren't perfect. There are mars and marks on our record. And so we fall short. And when God looks at every one of us, he will say, you are not good enough. But in the very next breath, he will say, but there is hope because you don't have to be. The Bible says, you are not good enough. You will never be good enough. But there is hope because you don't have to be. And the reason you don't have to be is because Jesus came and he lived that perfect life and now offers his perfect life to you in exchange for your imperfect life. Because Jesus loves you, he offers to give you the merits of his perfect life, which is an eternity with God, an eternal relationship with God. And what he does is he takes the punishment of your imperfect life which he bore by dying on a cross, paying the penalty of your sin and suffering the wrath of God. And I want you to notice that with the first religious worldview, uh, you have God's justice as the determining factor for whether uh, you are good enough, for whether you get into heaven. And in the second worldview, it is God's mercy that determines you know, whether you get to go into heaven. And in every religious worldview besides the Bible, it is either, um, it, uh, they, they're either pitting God's justice over his mercy or God's mercy over his justice. And only in the Bible will we find God's justice and his mercy being side by side. See, the good news of the Bible is that because of his great love for us, Jesus died on the cross in order to satisfy the justice of God. And in the very next, and in the very next breath, he would be able to extend to you God's mercy. 
releasing you of, your, of the penalty of your sin and giving you the merits of righteousness, eternal life. And every person in this room has the opportunity to receive God's gift of eternal life by declaring Jesus Christ as the Lord, which means that they, uh, which means that they confess and repent of their sins, they turn from their sins, and they commit to a life with Jesus where they are in relationship with him, and as well, uh, they are in service to him. And this is important because one day, every one of you Every one of us will be standing before God and will be facing judgment. And my prayer for you and my hope for you, my earnest desire for you is that on that day when you stand before God, you will hear the words, you're not good enough. But because of your faith in Jesus, because you love Jesus and because he has washed away your sins, you're in. Welcome home. That's the desire that I have for every one of you, that every one of you would choose Christ, that you would hear the gospel and that you would choose Christ. See, when you look at our passage, um, not everybody chose Christ. Right? There were some, we see in verse 8, where, uh, who, who heard uh, the word of God, who heard the message of the Bible, and they received it with joy and with gladness. But there were others, we see in verse 10, that rejected the gospel that rejected Jesus. And on face value, it would seem kind of weird, right? Why would anybody reject eternal life? Why would anybody reject the God of the universe? Why would anybody reject this good news of mercy and grace? And the reason is that there is a cost to following Jesus. There is a high cost If you are a Christian, then what that means is you are a worker. You are a worker. You are a harvester that is being sent out into the harvest field. You have been given a life mission that is now your life mission. You have given your life to Jesus' mission. It means that you have taken up the call to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. That means that your life, the rest of your life, is no longer yours. You are no longer living for you. You are now living for the honor of Jesus, for the pleasure of Jesus. And what brings Jesus the most pleasure is when more people recognize him as Lord, when more people recognize him as Savior, when more people recognize him as God. That is what brings him the most pleasure. And since our life objective is to please God, our number one priority is therefore to go and to help people who don't know Jesus to know Jesus and to help people who do know Jesus to love him more. That is our number one priority. That is our job. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum of Christianity or of Christian maturity. That is now your life goal. Right? If you are spiritually young, if you are a spiritual child, if you are new to the faith, you are not exempt from this call. You are still called to go and to share the gospel. But in addition, you are called to go and you are called to, um, and you are called to receive training. Right? Just like with any job. You have to do it. At first you'll be bad, but you will be trained and you will need to go and receive training. You know, that's one of the reasons why, uh, why, why, why every year we run these evangelism workshops, why we have these evangelism courses, right? Because we want to provide those of you who are spiritually young with training, with structured training so that you would be effective 
in articulating the good news of Jesus Christ. And so for those of you guys who are not actively engaged in sharing the gospel, for those of you guys who are spiritually young, for those of you guys who don't know how to share the gospel in a structured way, you know, we invite you guys. We have, we, 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 we have a, a workshop uh, this Saturday and next Saturday. Just show up or sign up, rather, so that you can be equipped, so that you can engage the world, so that you can be a harvester, that you can do the work of the harvest. Right? If you are a spiritual disciple, if you are more mature in that spectrum, then you have no excuse because you know how to share the faith and you ought to be engaging people with the gospel. You need to be telling people about Jesus because your life, again, is not about you but about pleasing God. And what brings him the most pleasure is that he is known by more people and that he is known deeper by those who already know him. And so if you consider yourself a spiritual disciple, one of your top priorities now is to engage people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Right? Not only the people you know, but to intentionally build relationships with new people for the purposes of sharing the gospel. Right? If you're even further along in your discipleship process, if, you are, if, if you're an elder statesman, you again are not exempt from sharing the gospel. But now you have an additional responsibility to train those under you to share the gospel. Right? And, and all of that, all of that is simply to say, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, if you number yourselves amongst the harvesters and the workers, it is your responsibility, it is my responsibility to either be training to share the gospel or to be actively sharing the gospel or to be training others or and to be training others to share the gospel. Right? We are called to talk about Jesus at work. We're called to talk about him in our classrooms. We're called to talk about him um, with our families. Right? We are called to be harvesters in these areas. Right? God gave us relationships with non-believers in order that we can tell them about the goodness of Jesus and about impending judgment apart from him. That is our responsibility our life call. And it is our job. And yes, it is going to be costly. It is hard work. Because what that means is, apart from having to work, apart from having to take care of your kids, apart from having to take care of your parents, apart from having to take care of your own stuff, apart from the normal responsibilities that we have as functional human beings. We have the call of Christ to go and tell people about him, about his goodness, about his mercy, about his grace. And what that means is in this life, there are no breaks. Your break is when you are dead. There is no leisure time and that is a hard calling if you look in verse four of our four of our text it says that these disciples didn't even have time to greet people on the side of the road they didn't even have time to engage in idle chit chat because all of their time was consumed with telling people about jesus there are no breaks your break is when you are dead. Our job is to tell people about Jesus. That is our call, our mission, primary objective. And with this, there is a cost. It is hard. On top of it being hard work, we see in verses, in, we see in verses uh, 10 to 11, that there will be people who will reject you, who will mock you, who will scorn you. Jesus himself says that when you are being sent out as a worker, as a harvester, you are like lambs among wolves. 
You will, run, you will run the risk of rejection. You will run the risk of scorn. You will run the risk of mockery. And I think I say this, but you already know this. Right? I think you already know this. Right? Which is why on some level, so many of us are so reluctant to share the gospel. It's not like we are we, it's not like we are lacking opportunity. It's not like you're going to school and saying, you know, where are all those non-Christians? I just can't find one. Right? It's not like you're at work and you're saying, where are all those non-Christians? I can't seem to find one. Right? The issue is that you know that there is a cost when you engage someone with the gospel. They may say, you're an idiot for believing in this stuff. You know that there is a cost. And as a result, there are some of us here who are just very reluctant to pay. Because, you know, who wants people to think that, who, to, to think ill, to, to have people think bad thoughts about them? Who wants people to reject them? Like, who wants to be put in a situation where, where, where your peers, you know, think you're, th- think you're dumb? And on top of that, who wants to have to work hard, right? Life is already hard, right? Why add more difficulty? Why add more work? Why add more burden? Right, that's the thought process. Right? We don't want to pay the cost. It's too high. But Jesus says, if you want to follow him, you must pay this cost. See, we said earlier that salvation is free. And it is. It must be. Because the standard that God has set for us is perfection. None of us meet the standard. Therefore, if we want to be saved, it must be offered to us freely. It must be given to us as a free gift that we receive. However, Jesus not only saved us from the pits of hell, but he saved us for discipleship. Salvation and discipleship are a package deal. You cannot have one without the other. And here is where it gets difficult because so many people, most people, most people that I speak to really, 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 really like the cost of salvation. They really like that it's free. But many of the people whom I've spoken with hesitate to pay the cost of discipleship. Right, salvation, yes, they want salvation. They want to be freed from sin. They want to be freed from guilt. They want to have a relationship with God, but they also don't want to submit to him. And you are being reminded today, fellow children of God, that you cannot separate salvation and discipleship. They are a package deal. There is a cost to pay to be with Jesus, to follow Jesus. However, to steal a phrase from Pastor David Platt, um, I believe the cost of non-discipleship is even higher. And I've listed, uh, and and, and I've listed four from our text. I I was only able to find four from our text. I remember the cost of following Jesus, it is high, it is hard work, but the cost of not following him, it is higher. And there are four in our text. The first is that the harvest is not harvested. Right in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, it says, and he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Right, the first cost of non-discipleship is that the harvest remain 
unharvested. Right? As we speak, in this moment, there are over 7 billion people in this world. 5 billion, over 5 billion. If the world were to end right now, would be facing judgment and would have no savior. One billion of them have never heard the gospel. Five billion people at this moment do not know the unconditional love of Christ and will remain lost if we do not take up the call and the cost of discipleship. And we don't even need to go that big because five billion might seem like a really big number. Right, if we simply think of our friends and our family. Those who don't know Jesus, the cost of our non-discipleship, the cost of our not taking up the call to witness, of us not taking up the call to evangelize, is that they will not know the love of God, is that they will remain lost. And I think it's one of the most sobering thoughts to know that God has entrusted you with the eternal destinations of your friends and family. that your unfaithfulness would lead to their suffering. The cost of discipleship is that they may think ill of you. The cost of your non-discipleship is that you may lose them for eternity. That's the first cost. Second, is that you do not experience or you do not witness God's power in your life. In Luke chapter 10, verses, six to eight, uh, in verses uh, 9 to 16, it says, Heal the sick uh, who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you uh, rejects me. As a harvester, one of the best news in the world um, if you're, like, a, a, as a Christian, one, 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 one of the best things for you to know is that you are not going out on your own. You are not going out on your own power or authority, uh, but, you, but you, we, are acting as extensions of Christ. And I, I use the word extension and not representative because I think that uh, the word extension um, is a better, is a, is a more accurate description of our role as Christians. See, I want you to notice that last phrase. Right? He who listens to you listens to me. And I want you to know, and I want, I want us to just, just talk about just for a moment what, what that means. Like, like, is Jesus saying, if they listen to you, then they'll listen to me? Right? As if, you know, like Jesus will come after you. Right? As if, you know, you're going to speak, and if, they're gonna, if, they, if they listen, if they hear you, if they listen to you, then, then they'll listen to me. Right? You know, if they listen to you, that's good. You know, I'll come later and they'll for sure, they'll for sure listen. Right? I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. Right? The second option is, um, is, is Jesus, is, is he saying, if they listen to you, it's as if they're listening to me. As if to say, you know what, you're good enough. Right? I don't need to go. Right? Jesus is saying, you know, I don't need to go, you know, you go. And if they listen to you, that's good enough. It's, like, it's as if they're listening to me. See, I don't think Jesus is saying that either. Rather, what I think he is saying is I think he is saying, or I actually, I don't think, I know he is saying, he who listens to you is listening to me. Meaning that he is present and that he is speaking through you. See, as an evangelist, you are more than a representative with a script or a speech or a story. Rather, you are an extension of the Almighty God who speaks through you. Likewise, as a harvester, 
You are not merely a representative, but you are an extension of the Almighty God who heals through you. Right, and healing can take, uh, could, 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 could be physical, it could be spiritual, it could be relational. The idea is that God works through you to impart healing onto others. Jesus has chosen to work through those who answer the call to discipleship. What that means is those who are willing to pay the cost of discipleship will experience the power of God through them and will, experience, and will witness miracles, will witness reconciliation, will witness healing. You know, it's, it's no wonder that those who have paid the cost of discipleship, that they're the ones with the strongest faith in God. Because they're the ones who experience and who continue to experience his power and witness his goodness, not only in their lives, but in the lives of others as God works through them. And it's also no wonder that those who do not pay the cost of discipleship or who have ceased to pay the cost of discipleship, that they are the ones who are skeptical and remain largely in doubt. Because you are the ones, if you have not paid the cost, you are the ones who hear a lot about God. We come in week in and week out and hear these talks about God but you have never experienced his power work through you. And just as a word for, 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 for those, because there's a pattern at, at our church and there's a pattern for, 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 for Christians in general. Um, we, we, we go through these phases in life where uh, when you first become a Christian, uh, you are on fire. You love God, love the church, want to engage and so you're serving a lot, you're in community, and you do all of these things. And, and as you do these things, you experience the power of God in your life, you experience the grace of God in your life, and things are amazing for a season. And life kind of takes over, and then you pull out of serving because you get too busy. And then weirdly enough you know your relationship with god deteriorates you know you lose the passion and the fire that you once had and and you're just like what happened what's wrong and for those of you who are there who are in that place what is wrong is that you have received a lot of talk about God, but because you have disengaged in mission, you have also ceased to experience his power in your life. You've ceased to witness his moving, his working. And my encouragement for you as your pastor, if that is you, to not further pull out from the church, to not further pull out of serving, to not further pull out of mission, but to engage, to engage people with the gospel, to evangelize, to engage people with the gospel, to build them up as a disciple maker, to engage people and to love them with the love of Jesus Christ. And as you do that, The promise is that God will speak through you and that he will do miracles and perform healing through you. And as you witness him work, as your soul witnesses him work, you will be renewed. And so that is my plea to you as your pastor. The cost of non-discipleship is that you will cease to experience his power, his working. The third cost of non-discipleship is that you will be judged like the rest of the harvest. 
In Luke 10, uh, verse 10, but when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it is more bearable on that day for Sodom than for the town. Right, as a reminder, there are only two categories of people. There are people who are uh, paying the cost of discipleship, and there are people who are paying the cost of non-discipleship. Right, you're either receiving the free gift of salvation and paying the cost of discipleship, or you are rejecting the gift and free to live as you please, but you pay the cost of non-discipleship, which includes being judged for your sins and being sentenced to an eternity apart from God. If you reject God, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he goes away. Right, notice, even if you reject him, judgment will still come. The fourth cost of non-discipleship is that you will miss out on a relationship with Jesus. See, if you receive the free gift of salvation and you pay the cost of discipleship, you see in our passage, you gain God's peace and his healing. In other words, you gain access into his presence. You gain a relationship with the almighty God. Right, and you get him now in this life. And I think that that's so amazing. How many people do you know who are searching for love and for meaning, for acceptance, for family, for wholeness? How many people do you know who are searching for these things? And yet, don't you see that Jesus provides all of these? And not only that, but he provides it in a way that no one else and nothing else can. The greatest gift that Jesus can give you is himself because only he can provide you with the love and acceptance that your soul is yearning for. And, and, and for those of you who, and, and they're, there's a sweetness to this, is there not? Especially for those of us who have been caught or who are struggling with habitual sinning, who consistently fall short of not only God's standard, but your standard, who consistently feel like a failure. And you're constantly striving to be accepted. Right, to know that God sees you and says, I accept you. You are mine. How sweet is that? That the longings of our soul can be met in just one person. And again, the best news is that you get him now. You get Jesus now. He's not someone you get when you die. He's someone you get now. He is the best that this life has to offer. And having Christ in this life alone is worth the cost of discipleship. But you not only get him now, you get him for all of eternity. Right? He is yours and you are his for the rest of eternity. Now conversely, the cost of non-discipleship is that you don't have him. The discipleship think that they have a better life in this life but a worse one in the next. But that's just not true. That's just not true. The best that this life has to offer is Jesus. And so if you do not pay the cost of discipleship, then you're missing out on the best in this life and you're missing out on the best in the next. Right, in this life, you miss out on the deepest love, the highest form of acceptance and the greatest purpose, because all of these are found in our God. The cost of non-discipleship is that you can have any and everything except Jesus. 
meaning that you'll get to have everything. You get to live however you want. You get to have, you, you, you get to try to seek after any and everything. But what you will not have is you will not have Jesus. Which means that you're missing out on the best in this life and you only have the worst in the next. The cost of discipleship is that you will work and suffer in order to make Jesus Christ known. But you gain Jesus both in this life and you are his and he is yours for the next as well. Now today you have two choices. Every one of you. You have a choice. Jesus or everyone else. And please understand that every day that you delay in making this decision, then you are passively agreeing to not pay the cost of discipleship. You are passively agreeing to pay the cost of non-discipleship. And every day you delay in making this decision, you are being deprived of relationship with Jesus. You are being deprived of participating in his great mission that he has in store for you. And so today, again, you are presented with two choices and my plea is that you choose. That you choose today. My prayer is that you will choose Jesus and that you will pay the cost so that you will have the best in this life and in the next. And if you are a Christian, um, I want you to make this your prayer as well. Right? Remember that in, G- in, 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 verse, uh, in verse 2, and we'll close with this. Uh, in, in, verse, uh, in verse 2, he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Um, to translate that, pray that God will move more people to pay the cost of discipleship. And we need to pray because this decision is not just a, it is not just a decision where once we're informed, well, then, then we'll choose God. No, this decision requires more than information. It requires heart transformation. Not only does it require you to know the cost of discipleship and non-discipleship, it requires God to work, to do a work in your heart where you will then want Jesus. Where when I say Jesus is the best thing in this life and the best thing in the next, you will say, yeah, man, I want that. That's who I want. And that work in your heart, that affection that comes from God. And so if you're a Christian, would you pray that prayer with me as well? That we will pray that God will soften uh, the hearts of our brothers and sisters, of our friends and family, so that we will see that Jesus is good, that we will have affection for him, and that we will pay that cost gladly to know him and to please him. Let's pray together now. God, we, uh, we ask that you will, um, that, that you would do this work in our hearts. God, today we've been confronted with, with, with the truth that there is a cost to following you, that the cost is high. But God, we have also been confronted by your word, and now we know, God, that the cost of not following you is high as well. And we ask, God, that you will today work in our hearts so that we will choose you, Jesus so that we would not only know from a logical point of view that you know, it is better to follow you than to not follow you, but that we would know in our hearts from a desire perspective that we want to follow you, God, more than we want to follow any or anyone else, anything or anyone else, God. We pray that you will do this work in our church, that we would be a body of harvesters, of workers, of people who pay the cost so that we will know you, have you in this life, and witness you work miracles around us and through us and in us, God. 
We ask for all of this in your good name, Jesus.